Hello and welcome back to another lesson on A-level physics. Today we are going to be concentrating on using the equation force equals mass times acceleration in unfamiliar contexts. As you can see from today's success criteria, those unfamiliar contexts are going to include lift problems or elevator problems and using F equals MA on inclines as well. There will be other examples too, but they are going to be the main focus for success today. Now, uh, there's no real theory for this one, so we're going to dive straight into some example questions. The first example question is shown here. It says a car of mass 800 kilograms accelerates at 3 meters per second squared. The frictional force on the car is 200 newtons, and we've been asked to work out the size of the engine force. Now, the first thing we've got to realize is that in the equation force equals mass times acceleration, that gives us the resultant force so it's possible for us to work out what the resultant force on the car is that produces this acceleration of three meters per second squared by using f equals m times a so we'll do 800 multiplied by three and when we do that we get 2400 newtons now that 2400 newtons is not the size of the engine force as you can see from the diagram that I have sketched there, the engine force is going to be acting on the car going forwards, but there is that 200 newton frictional force that acts in the opposite direction. Now, the resultant of those two forces has to be 2,400 newtons. So the engine force itself then is going to be subtracted 200 to equal 2,400. So the engine force has got to be 2,400 plus 200, which gives us 2,600 newtons. Okay, example two. A rocket of mass 3,000 kilograms is launched vertically and produces an initial thrust of 35,000 newtons. What is the initial acceleration of the rocket? So we know what the mass is and we know what the initial thrust is. When we do a sketch then of the forces on this, we need to know what the weight of the rocket is. We can work out the weight of the rocket because we know its mass. And of course, weight is mass times gravitational field strength. So we would do 3000 multiplied by 9.81, which gives 29,430 newtons as being the weight. The resultant force then is going to be that thrust which is acting upwards taken away from the weight which is 29,430. So the resultant force will be 5,570. We can then use the equation F equals M times A to work out what the acceleration is knowing that the resultant force is of course the thrust to take away the weight. So I've substituted those, you can see the numbers into F equals M times A. So the acceleration will be 5,570 divided by 3,000 which gives an answer of 1.86 meters per second squared. Okay, example three, the first example from the success criteria. It says we've got a lift or an elevator of mass 650 kilograms and it is moving downwards and decelerates at 1.5 meters per second squared until it stops. And we've been asked to calculate the tension in the cable during that deceleration. Now, with elevator problems, it's very important to consider the direction it's moving in and the direction of its acceleration or deceleration. Now, I've done a very quick sketch there. You can see that the tension force is obviously acting upwards. That will be in the cable that is holding the lift. The weight of the lift is acting downwards and it is moving downwards as well. But because it is decelerating, in order to slow down the, that elevator, the tension will need to be bigger than the weight of the elevator. So the resultant force will be the tension take away the weight because the tension has to be the bigger of those forces. I can work out what the resultant force on the lift is by doing mass times acceleration, in this case deceleration. So the tension take away the weight is going to be equal to the resultant force, which is 975 newtons. So we can see that T minus mg is equal to 975. Now I know what the mass of the elevator is, so I can work out what the tension is now by doing 975 plus the weight, the weight of course being 650 times 9.81, and that gives me a final answer for the tension in the cable to be 7,345 newtons. 
Okay, example four, a much more involved question. The same scenario, we've got an elevator or a lift, and it says an elevator of mass 1,500 kilograms is stationary, uh, in other words, it's not moving, before it accelerates upwards at 0.2 meters per second squared to a maximum speed of 1.5 meters per second. It remains at this speed for the rest of the journey, and we've got here a series of things that we need to calculate. The first thing that asks us to calculate is the tension in the cable when the lift is stationary. Now, if you think back to Newton's first law, when something is stationary, the resultant force on it is zero. So that means that the tension that acts upwards in the cable must be equal to the weight that acts downwards. So in order to work out the tension in the cable, all that we actually need to do is work out the weight by doing 1,500 times by 9.81 which comes out as 1,500 newtons. Of course, there's a little bit of rounding involved there, but it will come out as 1,500 newtons when rounded. Okay, part B says calculate the tension in the cable whilst the lift is accelerating upwards at 0.2 meters per second squared. So if the lift is accelerating, it's speeding up, going in an upwards direction, then that means that the tension needs to be bigger than the weight. So the tension take away the weight is equal to the resultant force. So if we work out what the resultant force is doing mass times acceleration, we find that the resultant force is 1,500 multiplied by 0.2, which is 300 newtons. I can then set that equal to T minus mg, and then just simply add the weight onto that 300 to get me the tension in the cable to be 1,800 newtons. Okay, part C says how long does it take the lift to reach its maximum speed? If you need to flick back in the video to find the information from the early part of the question, that's not a problem. Uh, but the stuff that we do know, we can lay out in the form of a SUVAP. We know that the lift was initially not moving, so U is going to be zero. We know that it reaches a, reaches a maximum speed of 1.5 meters per second, and we know that the acceleration is 0.2 meters per second squared. So the only unknowns in this is S and T. Because it asks us how long it takes us to reach its maximum speed, we are trying to work out T. So we need an equation that links U, V, A and T. Feel free, obviously, to use your formula sheet, but I know off the top of my head that we are going to be using V equals U plus A T. I need to get T on its own, so I will subtract U from both sides to give me V minus U equals A T, and then divide the left-hand side by A to give me T on its own on the right-hand side. I substitute the values in, so I will do 1.5 take away 0 divided by 0 0.2, and that gives me a time of 7.5 seconds to reach that maximum speed. Part D says, how far will the lift travel during that acceleration? So I don't need to do a new SUVAT. I know what U, V, A and T now are. So I can use any equation that gives me a value of S. I'm going to choose to use U, T plus a half A, T squared, which is going to simplify down to a half, multiplied 0.2, multiplied by 7.5 squared to give an answer of 5.63 metres. And then party finally says the tension in the cable when the lift is moving at a constant speed of 1.5 sec uh, 1.5 meters per second. Well, if we're moving at a constant speed, the resultant force is back to being zero. So the tension is just equal to the weight. So just like for part A, T equals mg. So the answer comes out rounded to 1,500 newtons. OK, I would like to have a go at at least two sets of the summary questions. The consolidation questions are in lilac, the standard demand questions are in yellow, and the stretch and challenge questions for those of you which are going for A's and B's are labelled in green. First question on consolidation says a rocket of mass 550 kg blasts vertically from the launch pad at an acceleration of 4.2 metres per second squared and we've been asked to calculate first of all the weight of the rocket. Very nice straightforward question. We know that weight is mass times gravitational field strength so we'll do 550 multiplied by 9.81 to give me a final answer of 5,396 newtons. Please don't forget to put newtons on the end. Then we were asked to work out the thrust of the rocket engines. 
Well, there are two forces acting vertically on this rocket. We have the weight, which we just worked out going down, and there is going to be the thrust of the rocket engines acting upwards. Now, we can work out what the resultant force on the rocket is because we know what its acceleration and mass are. So if we do F equals M times A, we do 550 times 4.2, which tells us that the resultant force is 2,310 newtons. Now, because it accelerates upwards, the thrust has to be greater than the weight. So the thrust minus mg is going to be equal to 2,310. So if I add the weight onto the other side, the thrust force is going to be 2,310 plus 5,396, which gives me a final answer of 7,706 newtons. Question 2. A 38-tonne lorry is travelling at a steady speed along the road, and it do, as it does, it experiences a total resistive force. So that resistive force might be friction, air resistance, and other drag forces of 4,265 newtons. The driver then pushes the accelerator pedal down, and this increases the tractive force, or the engine force, to 5,250 newtons. Calculate what the instantaneous acceleration of the lorry is. So, first thing to consider is we've been given the mass as a 38 tonne lorry. We're not normally given mass in tonnes. That is quite an unusual question for A level physics, but you are expected to know that one tonne is equal to a thousand kilograms. So, that means we've got a 38,000 kilogram lorry. Now, we can work out um, from this what the resultant force is because we know that the forwards force is 5,250 newtons. The resistive force is a 4,265 newtons, so the resultant force is 985 newtons. I can then use forces mass times acceleration to work out what the instantaneous acceleration is by doing 985 divided by 38,000, which gives us an acceleration of 0.026 metres per second squared. On to the standard demand questions then. It says a lift and its occupants have a total mass of 1,200 kilograms. We've been asked to calculate the tension in the lift cable when the lift is, first of all, stationary. Now, when the lift is stationary, we know, of course, that the tension has to equal the weight because the resultant force is zero. So what we will then do is do mass, which is 1,200, multiplied by gravitational field strength, which is 9.81. That gives us, of course, a weight and therefore a tension of 11,772 newtons. Part B has asked us to work out the tension in the cable when we're going at a constant speed. That is exactly the same question as part A, because when we're going at a constant speed, again, the resultant force is zero. So the answer will once again, of course, be 11,772 newtons. Now we've got part C. We are ascending, moving upwards at a constant acceleration of 0.4 metres per second squared. So this is where we need to consider the direction of the forces. We know that the tension is acting upwards and the weight is acting downwards. That means that the tension needs to be bigger than the weight because it is accelerating upwards. And so tension take away the weight is equal to MA. I can work out what the resultant force is by doing 1,200 multiplied by 0.4. And of course, we'll add on to that the weight, which is 1,200 times 9.81, which gives us a final answer of 12,252 newtons. My newtons there seems to have been missed off the scan. My apologies for that. Then part D says we are descending, moving downwards, but as we are moving downwards, we are decelerating. So if we are moving down but slowing down, then that again means that the tension needs to be bigger than the weight in order to make it slow down. So T minus mg is going to be equal to the resultant force. So it actually falls out as the exact same mathematics from part C to give us an answer of 12,252 newtons. Okay, question two. This one's taken straight from an exam question. It says, in 1969 moon landings, the lunar module separated from the command module above the surface of the moon when it was travelling at a constant speed of 2,040 metres per second. 
In order to descend to the moon's surface, the lunar module needs to use its thrusters to slow it down, as shown in the diagram. The gravitational field strength on the moon is 1.61 meters per second squared. That is important information because if we are finding the weight of anything or doing a SUVAT, then the acceleration will not be 9.81 because we are, of course, now on the moon and not on the Earth. Part A says calculate the average thrust. So no, it doesn't. It says the average thrust from the rocket's thrusters was 30 kilonewtons, 30,000 newtons, and the mass of the lunar module was 15,100 kilograms. Calculate the horizontal deceleration of the lunar module. Well, because we know what the thrust is and it's the only force acting, there are no resistive forces. The resultant force is therefore that 30 kilonewtons. The mass is 15,100, so the acceleration is going to come out there as 2 meters per second squared. Please do not forget to put the unit ms to the minus 2 for that. Part B says calculate the time for the lunar module to slow down to the required horizontal velocity of 150 meters per second. Assume that the mass remained constant. So this is a SUVAT question then. Uh, we know that S, well, sorry, we don't know S, but we know that the initial speed is 20,040 metres per second. That was the, uh, the module's initial speed. It tells us in part B that the required horizontal velocity is 150 metres per second. So the final velocity V is 150. And the acceleration we have just worked out, the horizontal deceleration is 2 metres per second squared. And because it is a deceleration, A equals minus 2. Now, we want to find the time that it takes to do that deceleration. So an equation that links u, v, a and t is probably the best one going to be v equals u plus a, t. I can rearrange that for t by subtracting u from v and then dividing by a. When you then substitute your numbers in, you would do 150, take away 2040, divided by minus 2, which should come out as 945 seconds. Okay, part C. The rocket was then used to control the vertical descent so that the lunar module descended vertically with a constant velocity as shown. Due to the use of fuel in the previous deceleration, the mass of the lunar module has fallen by 53%. C part 1 says draw a diagram to show the forces acting on the lunar module as it descends vertically. So the vertical forces are of course going to be the thrust which is acting upwards and the weight which is acting downwards. C part 2. Calculate the thrust needed to maintain a constant vertical downwards velocity. So in that situation then we've got to look at what the mass is now. We know that it's fallen by 53% which means that 47% of the mass remains. Earlier in the question, we were told that the mass was 15,100 kilograms, 47% remains, so I'll times that by 0.47 to give me the mass that remains as being 7,097 kilograms. I can then point out, well, because we are descending at a constant vertical velocity, the resultant force is equal, so the, uh, the resultant force, sorry, is zero, so the thrust equals the weight. So if I work out the, net, the weight of it currently to be 7,097 7 times by 1.61, that of course being the gravitational field strength on the moon, that comes out with a thrust of 11,426 newtons. Then the final part of the question says when the lunar module was 1.2 metres from the lunar surface, the rocket was switched off. At this point, the vertical velocity was 0.8 metres per second. Calculate the vertical velocity with which the lunar module reached the surface. This again is a SUVAT question. I know that S is 1.2 metres because it is vertically 1.2 metres above the surface. Its initial speed is 0.8 metres per second and the acceleration, of course, is equal to the gravitational field strength on the moon, which is 1.6 metres per second squared. Now I will use v squared equals u squared plus 2as to give me the final speed v. I'll take the square root of that to be v equals root u squared plus 2as. When I substitute those values in, I should come out with a velocity of 2.1 metres per second. 
Now we come on to the stretch and challenge questions. It says a car of mass 1,400 kilograms pulling a trailer of mass 400 kg accelerates from rest um, to a speed of 9 meters per second in a time of 60 seconds on a level road. Assuming that air resistance is negligible, calculate the tension in the tow bar. What makes this a stretch and challenge question, in my opinion, is the fact that you've got two different objects. You've got the car, which has got two forces acting on it, and you've got the trailer, which has got only one force acting on it. Now, if we look at the forces on the car, there is the engine force going forwards and the tension going backwards. But in terms of the trailer, there is only the tension acting on it. This is, of course, because we've assumed that air resistance is negligible. So to calculate the tension, we cannot consider what is going on in the car because we don't know what the engine force is. If we look at the trailer, though, we know what the mass of the trailer is. It's 400 kilograms. And we know what the acceleration is, or we know it accelerates from 0 to 9 meters per second. So we can work out what the acceleration of the trailer is and then work out what the resultant force on the trailer will be. So acceleration is, of course, change in velocity over time. So we do 9 divided by 60, which gives an acceleration for this whole system of 0.15 meters per second squared. So that means that the trailer obviously is accelerating at 0.15 meters per second squared. Because that acceleration is caused by the tension in the tow bar, then that means we now just need to use F equals M times A to give an answer for the tension as 60 newtons. For part B, I've been asked to calculate the engine force. Well, the resultant force is going to be, of course, the engine force take away the tension. Uh, we know what the mass of the car is. It's 1,400, and we know what its acceleration is. So the resultant force is going to be 210 newtons. I can then say, well, the engine take away the uh, tension is equal to 210. So the engine force is 210 plus 60, which is 270 newtons. OK, question two. This is, of course, meeting the second success criteria to do with the incline. It says a brick of mass 3.2 kilograms on a sloping flat roof at 30 degrees to the horizontal slides at a constant acceleration two metres down the slope in two seconds from rest. Calculate the acceleration of the brick. My first thoughts with this, there is no diagram with it. I would want to draw a diagram to show what is going on. So I've drawn an incline at 30 degrees and I've labelled the forces that are acting on it because that might help later on. The weight, of course, acts vertical down. Friction is acting up the slope because the brick is sliding down. And then the support force or the normal contact force is acting at 90 degrees to the surface. So I want to work out what the acceleration is. I've been given a, quite a lot of mechanical information. I know the distance it travels is two metres. I know it begins at rest and I know that it takes two seconds to do that. So I can work out the acceleration if I use an equation that links S, U, A and T. The equation that I will therefore use is S equals U, T plus a half a t squared. That u t is just zero because u is equal to zero. So when I rearrange this equation for the acceleration, I will get two multiplied by s divided by t squared. So the answer for the acceleration will come out as one meter per second squared. Part b wants me to calculate the frictional force on the brick due to the roof. Now I will get the laser pointer out just so that I can show you uh, how I'm going to do this. Because it is sliding down, the force that is making it slide down is the weight here. Now, the weight has two components, a component that is perpendicular to the slope and a component that is parallel to the slope. Now, we did look at a, in a previous lesson that if this makes a right angle triangle here, then the angle between the weight and the line that balances the support force, the, that is also going to be 30 degrees. So the component of weight that acts down the slope is W sine 30. Now, previously, when we've considered equilibrium problems, we'd have said that W sine 30 is equal to the friction. It won't be equal to the friction in this case, though, because it is accelerating, and so the resultant force is not zero. So what we can say is that W sine 30 take away the friction is equal to mass times acceleration, of course, the resultant force. So the first thing to do for part B, then, is work out what that resultant force is, mass times acceleration. 
the uh, mass of the brick is 3.2. It accelerates at 1 meters per second squared. So F comes out as being 3.2 newtons. So that means, of course, that the weight is going to be 31.4, given that we times that by 9.81. And so W sine 30, take away the friction, is equal to 3.2. So if I want to work out the frictional force, I just rearrange that equation to give me W sine 30, take away 3.2, substituting all the numbers in, gives me a frictional force of 12.5 newtons.